Okay, ladies, so I'm taking off my mask, so stay away. Okay? Um, I need to put this right more far away. I'll put it on my wrist, how inventive. Um, yay, so thank you for letting me be here today. I appreciate the invitation, Annalise and um, Amy. Um, so we are here to talk about mental health. And before we start, um, I thought I would tell you a little bit about who I am and my background and why I'm standing in front of you guys today. So um, uh, my career-wise, I don't know if you got my bio, but I was a flight attendant for about 12 years. And then I was in the radio industry in the sales and marketing aspect um, for about eight years. And then I was in um, print marketing with Yellow Book and uh, did SEO and SEM, search engine marketing and search engine optimization for Yellow Book for a couple of years. Then I was in retail management and now I'm at IU. I work full time over at Student Central. So two things about my career. There's been a lot of stress. So I've had to pay a lot of attention to my own mental health. And I love taking care of people and I love helping people. So um, that's kind of that's kind of what I do. So I'm very happy to be here. I'm so glad you took time out of your day, out of your Friday afternoon, to talk with me about mental health and let me share some insights that I've gained from you. One of the things I wanted to mention is that I am not an expert in any way, shape, or form. I'm not a nurse. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a psychologist. I'm not even a psychology student. But I've had a lot of therapy, so that counts for something, right? So um, also, my sister has mental health conditions. And I'm, I'm complaining right now with our beautiful bells, but that's okay. My sister has mental health conditions, and she has struggled with um, bipolar disorder, OCD, which is obsessive compulsive disorder, panic disorder, anxiety disorder, and PTSD. So she's got a lot of stuff going on. So with her and my family, and we have a pretty close relationship, I've gained some experience um, learning about mental health conditions. And because of her, I have learned about my own mental health, and I've paid more attention to my own mental health because of how I get affected by her mental health. So in a nutshell, that's me. Um, I wanted to make sure that you understood that I was not a professional. Um, also, just wanted to share a little story. My sister, by the way, does give me permission to share her story with you all, okay? So um, in 2018, I had mentioned, I think my glasses just went to Side. Yeah, let me pick them up real quickly. I don't want to step on them and I don't want to lose them and I want to know where they are if I need them. Um, so in 2018, my sister came to stay with me for a couple of weeks. And I had known, obviously, I had known that she had these mental health conditions, but I had no idea how strongly she was affected by them on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so in 2018, she was having some problems up in Wisconsin where she lives. She lives about eight hours away. And I said, why don't you just come down and see me? It's been about 12 years since you made the trip down here to see me. So why don't you just come and take a little escape? So she came down and stayed with me for three weeks and then another three weeks in December between Christmas and New Year's. And I have to tell you, it was a revelation to me just how strongly and negatively she was affected by her mental health conditions on a day-to-day -day basis. I was really blown away and my eyes were opened to how much of a struggle she really has. Previously in the past, when I would ask her over the phone, what did you accomplish today? I wouldn't say it that way, but that's kind of what I was thinking because I'm, I'm a manager. Um, I always think about what are my accomplishments, what are other people's accomplishments. I'd say, hey, what did you do today? And she would tell me that she took a shower. And I would wait for more, and sometimes there wouldn't be more. When she came to stay with me for those three weeks in November of 2018, I began to understand why that was a big deal. That was a huge accomplishment for her to actually get in the shower and, and, and go through that whole process. Because of her OCD primarily, she washed her hair 40 times instead of, you know, just the regular once or maybe twice around. But anyway, um, she was seriously affected, and that impacted me. So I started therapy again in um, January of 2019 um, to help me nurture my soul a little bit, to help me heal, because I felt really frazzled after having been in such close contact for such a long time on a day-to-day -day basis with her. Um, in April of 2019 is when I uh, found NAMI, and NAMI is a national illness on mental illness, and they are exactly who I needed to find. They are a group that supports the family members of people who um, have mental health conditions. So they're there to support people like me who don't have a mental health condition and who need to understand it more. So again, all of this just to say, ladies, this is part of what I, I live with um, and I deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. And again, my sister's mental health conditions help me to be more aware of my own 
And and I'm so passionate about talking about mental health, and that's one of the reasons why I'm so excited to be here. So Anne will be me um, to talk about four topics in particular, okay? So we're going to talk about self-doubt today. We're going to talk about the imposter syndrome, which goes hand-in-hand -hand with self-doubt. We're going to talk about isolation. Uh, and we're also going to just talk about some general mental health tips. Um, why are we even talking about mental health in general? Well, if you stop and think about it, mental health is every bit as important as your physical health. If you think about when you've gotten a cold in the past, just a simple cold, and you have the sniffles, and your head is fuzzy, and you don't feel like talking to anybody, you just want to curl under the covers and, and kind of, um, you know, sit on the couch, and, and you just don't want to make any decisions, your mental health is exact, exactly the same way, and it affects you. It affects how you feel, and it affects how you act and how you behave. So if you have good mental health, and if you nurture good mental health habits, you will be in a better position to fight off things like self-doubt, and the imposter syndrome, and even isolation. You know how to deal with isolation, and when those things come around and then um, manifest themselves in your life. I'm going to um, have some of this, my sequence of slides memorized, but not all of them. So I'm going to take a moment. Okay, so talking about self-doubt. So, if I ask everyone who has ever experienced self-doubt to raise their hands, I bet everyone would. I know I would for sure. Where, where it comes from, it's a number of things. I know that um, with some of the counseling that I've had, I had self-esteem issues when I was young. So when I was in my late teens and early 20s, I recognized that I didn't feel very good about myself. I felt... I felt embarrassed sometimes just for asking for things that I needed, as if I didn't deserve to have the things that I needed, whether it was, you know, in high school, a new pair of jeans from my mom or dad. I'm like, I don't know. I just felt like I didn't deserve things, and I, I wasn't worthy of things. And, and by the time I was like 24, I was over that. I knew that wasn't right. I knew that, ultimately, I wanted to feel better, and I, I didn't believe the lies that I had somehow picked up along the way. I didn't believe them, and I didn't want to believe them. I wanted to put them aside, but I didn't know how, and I didn't know if that was okay. I didn't. I wanted, I wanted permission. I wanted someone to tell me it's okay to feel good about yourself. So first of all, I'm here to tell you it's okay to feel good about yourself. That is your primary goal in life. It should be. You are this wonderful, whole human being that's been created, and even if you've made mistakes, and of course we all have, um, even if people have made fun of you, like who hasn't been made fun of? Like when you were six years old and someone on the playground might have made fun of you for some reason. Um, that sticks with some people. I know I remember being made fun of by someone who was in two, you know, fourth grade when I was in third grade. And it hurt my feelings. And I still remember that. And even though I've gone through therapy and I know I'm a wonderful human being, I just think about, wow, I was such a sensitive girl, and it makes me wonder how many other children are sensitive, and how many other of us are carrying those things from so long ago. So, self-doubt comes from a lot of different places, and part of, the, part, of the, um, part of the past can affect your future. So think about the thoughts that are coming into your head. Really start to self-assess and become self-aware. That is one of my main messages for today. Start to become aware of the thoughts that are in your head. Um, if there's a negative thought, this is the, another um, key message for today. Positive self-talk only. If you are trying to combat self-doubt and build self-confidence, which is going to help you with the imposter syndrome, which we're going to talk about, the only way that you can conquer self-doubt and build that self-confidence is if you're good to yourself. If you remind yourself of the good things that you've already done, and of the things that you um, do on a day-to-day -day basis that are awesome. You pat yourself on the back. You know why? Because you're probably the only one today who's going to pat yourself on the back. I don't know if you've noticed or not, but if you walk down the street or go about your day, um, in typical times in a classroom or if you have a job, your manager is not going to come around every 15 minutes and say, hey, I noticed you did such a great job. Awesome. I really appreciate that. But if you notice that about yourself, if you recognize that you yourself did a fantastic job at whatever it was, that's really important. And that's that's going to go in your bank to draw from when you have those low self-doubt kind of days or the low self-esteem, low self-confidence and self-doubt days. You're going to draw from that bank and you're going to 
at some point, oh my gosh, I shouldn't have been chosen for this project. You're going to reframe that, you're going to turn it around and think positively, and you're going to say, I was the only one who should have been chosen for that project. I am the one to do this. I'm going to knock it out of the park. So if you have these negative thoughts that come in, recognize them, be the self-aware person that we're talking about, and then reframe it. Turn the negatives into the positives and be your own cheerleader and be your own best friend. It is such a good feeling. We're gonna practice that together in a little while. And you guys are probably thinking, oh no, I hate doing stuff like that. It's gonna feel funny, it's gonna feel silly, but we're gonna do it together and it's gonna feel good when we're done. So I just wanted to prepare you a little bit for that um, and let you know that that really does help. If you start to repeat the same thing over and over to yourself, like I am good, I am worthy, I like myself, guess what? Sooner or later, you're going to start to believe it. And that's, again, what helps to conquer self-doubt and, and helps to manage the imposter syndrome. Let me flip my card. Another thing um, that's important to think about uh, your self-talk and making sure that it's positive self-talk is because, first of all, you always have something to say, right? There's always a thought that's running through your head. The second thing is you're always listening. To those thoughts that are running through your head. So again, be self-aware, listen to what it is. If it's negative, I want you to put up a, uh, a self, um, I, I call it a stop sign. I told my sister in her world, uh, put up a stop sign in your head. I'm a really visual person. So you know those emojis, like the bit emoji with your little um, avatar that looks like you? There's one where she's holding a stop sign and it just says stop and she has this expression on her face. I told my sister, put up that stop sign whenever you feel these thoughts coming through because they are not yours. They are not you. Thoughts are going to come into your head, all kinds of crazy thoughts throughout your life. And I'm here to tell you that is true. Thoughts, weird thoughts, negative thoughts, mean thoughts, all kinds of thoughts. Um, and, and they're not me. And I can calmly, now that I know everything that I know about who I am and, and my experience and where I come from and where I am, I can step back and I can objectively look at those thoughts, especially if they're thoughts, negative thoughts about myself. I can step back and say, oh, I didn't make a very good decision that day, but that's not affecting me. That doesn't mean I'm a bad person because I made a negative decision. Um, if I happen to be having one of those fat days, instead of me saying, oh my God, I'm so fat, and we've all felt that way, right? We just have. I don't have to accept that. I can stand back and say, now, really, take a good look. Do you believe that? No, I don't. What can I say instead? I'm not where I want to be, but that's okay. I'm working on it. And that's the level of self-acceptance that comes from believing all the positive things that I have said to myself through the years and that you can kind of um, start to say as well. Judgment. Judgment. That's another reason why people have self-doubt. So... All of us have made mistakes, as we've kind of talked about. All of us have made some, some decision or other that we wish we hadn't had. We've maybe fallen flat on our face in front of a, a group of people, um, whether it was a presentation or a project at school, something where we didn't um, make the best decision. We stayed up too late. We didn't prepare. Um, maybe we hung out with some people and we vandalized some property, something like that. But you're no longer there. You've learned some things from whatever your mistakes have been. And so now you're in a new place. And you, like I said, you've learned some things and you, you've matured, you've grown up, you have made the decision to not do those things anymore because they're damaging. They're damaging to yourself, uh, your self-esteem, your self-confidence. They're damaging maybe to your community. So you can, again, stand back and assess that behavior without judging yourself. And you can say, you know what? I can make a better decision. I can do better. And so there's a meme. I really like the memes that I find on Pinterest. And um, one of the memes says, don't judge me by my past because I don't live there anymore. And so you can take that to heart yourself. Don't judge yourself by past decisions that you've made because you've learned some things and you're not there anymore. You've made better decisions since then. So take heart in that and, and let that help to build your self-confidence. Um, and again, we're going to use that um, to help combat the imposter syndrome. So as I said, self-doubt and the imposter syndrome kind of go hand in hand because 
if you don't have a lot of confidence in yourself, if you're constantly um, berating yourself with all these negative thoughts and you believe the lies that you come to believe over the years, whether someone else has said them about you or you just picked up some things and you've chosen to believe negative things about yourself, you're going to have self-doubt and the imposter syndrome is going to be really, really hard to ward off. So the imposter syndrome is basically this thing that happens sometimes and it doesn't happen to everybody, but it happens to a lot of us. In fact, it happened to me when Annalise asked me to take part in this today. My first thought was, oh my gosh, that is so exciting. And the second thought was, oh my gosh, why me? I have nothing to contribute. I don't think I'm the right person for this. That is what went through my head. But because of everything that I've learned, I was able to step back from that and say, go away. That's not my thought. I don't. I choose to believe something else. I choose to believe I am the perfect person for this position today. Um, so the imposter syndrome is believing that you're a fake, that you're a phony, that you don't believe the credit that you've been given so far. Like if you've got an A on a project or on an assignment, you believe that the instructor must have decided to grade easy on that particular thing. You're also afraid that someone is going to find out any day now that you are not as great as they think you are. And that's a heavy burden to live under, the imposter syndrome. Um, did you guys know? Probably not. I didn't know this. Albert Einstein had the imposter syndrome. Albert Einstein, the, the father of relativity, all the things that he accomplished, and he felt like a fraud. He felt like he did not deserve the attention. He did not deserve the accolades. He didn't understand what all the fuss was about. So I'm telling you, if, if it can happen to someone like Albert Einstein, it's, it's probably going to show up in your life at one time or another. Um, it happens to me, but again, because I have a solid foundation of, of a healthy sense of self-esteem and self-confidence, and I'm not talking about arrogance, so um, having a strong sense of self-confidence is a wonderful thing, and I am a confident person, but I try really hard not to be arrogant. I don't ever say that I'm better than somebody at something. That's not what I'm trying to say. That's not what I believe. I know that I'm a good photographer, but I'm not the best photographer in the world. Um, so if you have a strong sense of confidence, again, when that imposter syndrome comes knocking on your door and you get those doubts and those fears, you can look at it and, and realize that it's not true. It's something that you can choose to believe or you can choose to turn it away. So I watched a couple of YouTube videos. I always watch YouTube videos. In fact, um, I'm including a reference and resources list. I've already emailed it to Annalise and she's gonna email it to you guys. I wanna make sure that you know what I'm gonna do. Um, so I'm including a bunch of different videos that I've watched through the years on um, motivation, inspiration, confidence, um, anything psychology where I want to feel empowered. Um, I've included links to those videos, including this one that I just watched this week called um, well, it was a TED Talk, and I'm not sure the name of it, but it's by a woman named Lou Solomon, and she was talking about the imposter syndrome. And she attributed four elements to the imposter syndrome, and she called them the fantastic four. And it was anxiety, um, fear of failure, perfectionism, and self-doubt. So those four things can lead to um, the imposter syndrome and be a result of the anxiety and the fear of failure, fear of um, not being perfect. So uh, I just wanted to mention too, I'm so glad that I watched that because I wanted to tell you guys, one of the messages I wanted to give you was to be vulnerable, to be open to being vulnerable. We already talked about how all of us have made mistakes in our lives. That's a given. We're going to make mistakes every day for something. You know, We're going to make a mistake, whether it's a big mistake or a small mistake. That's what we do. And that's okay. Um, but part of, part of growth, part of gaining confidence is knowing that you can open up yourself to being vulnerable, whether that is saying, I don't know how to do something or like in conversations. So I'm in grad school, I'm in a master's program and I'm telling you, it is very intimidating and, uh, it's hard to say, it's hard to open your mouth and actually say, I don't understand what you're talking about. Tell me, tell me what you mean. Tell me what that is. But that's what I found myself doing. And because of that, because I opened my mouth that first time and said, I don't understand what you mean by that. Or I don't know how to do this. Where am I going to find this information? How do I go about this process? 
Because I opened my mouth that first time, it became easier the second and third time, especially because the world didn't explode. Nobody pounded me into the ground. Nobody called me stupid. Nobody diminished me in any way. In fact, they applaud you when you do things like this for having the courage to be vulnerable. So I want to encourage you guys to open yourselves up to vulnerability throughout the way, throughout your journey, um, because it will help to establish your, your self-confidence. Some other things that, uh, that Lou Solomon said in her um, TED Talk was something that we've already talked about, being aware, being aware of the negative voices in your head. Be aware when they come in, and then don't be afraid to address them. That's one of the ways that you can dispel them as well. You know, like uh, when you're a kid and you, you think there are monsters under the bed, what do you do? First of all, you go to your mom and dad. So you're asking for help. That's another one of the things from the video. Ask for help. Be vulnerable. Ask for help. Um, but dispelling fears, how do you do that? you got to face them. So you went to mom and dad when you were young and you had monsters under the bed. And what did mom and dad do? They went back to your room and they turned on the light. Right? And then they looked under the bed. They tried to face those monsters right then and there to say, you know what, if there are monsters there, I'm gonna protect you and I'm gonna I'm gonna face them for you and with you and we're gonna take care of this. But ultimately, guess what? There were no monsters. It was just a fear that you had in your head. Same with imposter syndrome. If you have these fears, you were chosen for a, a project and you don't believe that you should be on the team, maybe you were chosen as the lead for the team and you don't believe that you have the abilities, there's something in you that's knocking you down, trying to pull you down from your right, rightful place at the top of the mountain. Um, you can step back and, and, and recognize that that is just a fear, and you're going to assess whether it's true or not. And then you're going to decide that it's not. And that will help you to walk away from imposter syndrome. It's going to come, and those crazy thoughts of self-doubt and self um, self diminishing thoughts are going to come and you're going to have the ability and the strength and the experience because you're going to do it again and again to say, you know what, that's not mine. Yeah, it's there, but I, I, I'm turning my back on that. And that's going to be really important for you. So I hope you remember. And this stuff is not rocket science, you guys. So that's another thing. Um, I did a, a similar workshop in the spring in February for a group for the Kelly School. And one of the things that I wanted to make sure they understood it's not rocket science. We talk about mental health and the things that we can do to make ourselves more grounded and more centered and more solid and springboard into a place of self-confidence. And um, I feel like um, everyone was maybe waiting for uh, like the meat and potatoes of the presentation, you know? And this is it, you guys. This is the meat and potatoes. Become self-aware, you know? And then and then you got to keep saying positive things to yourself. I can do this. I was made for this. I'm the only one who was chosen for this. Those are the things. That is the meat and potatoes. So um, I'm going to take a two-second break, grab a tissue, because my nose is running, because it's cold. See how prepared I was? I knew. See? I'm just patting myself on the back. That's one of those things. Being my own cheerleader. Sorry. Okay, so um, so with the imposter syndrome, let's see. Back to Lou Solomon. She did a great job. Um, so the Fantastic Four, the anxiety, the self-doubt, the perfectionism, and the fear of failure. Addressing, becoming aware of the negative voices in your head and then addressing them, facing them head on, choosing to not... Um, Embrace them, choosing to turn your back on those negative voices, the negative uh, um, thoughts, and call them out as lies, because that's what they are. I don't know where they come from. It doesn't matter. They're going to come. They always do, but you can fight them back, and I, I hope you do. I hope you know that. It's a choice that you can make. You don't have to believe it. Um, and then empower brilliance in others. Recognize brilliance in others. And by doing this, have you ever heard the, the expression, joy begets joy? So if you're joyful about something, and if you're grateful about something, guess what? You have more things to be grateful for because they just keep showing up. If you choose happiness, if you choose joy in your life, if you choose to have a joyful attitude, you're going to keep finding things to be joyful about. It just kind of happens. The same thing happens when you choose to compliment someone else. If 
you see someone else doing a good job, if they're just shining at what they do, they're, they're just awesome, man. They're so on top of it. They're so organized. They're so, they're so innovative. You need to say something to them if you recognize it because you instilling confidence in them helps to instill confidence in you. It really does because you kind of put yourself in the position of, um, for lack of a better word, you put yourself in the position of judge. You're judging their work and you have deemed it acceptable. In fact, you have deemed it exceptional. And that's cool. But again, you're, you're giving them a compliment. You're giving them a gift. And you don't even realize you're giving yourself a gift as well. So if it's well-deserved, I'm not saying go around complimenting people for stuff that you don't believe in. Um, but if you see something that really strikes you as impressive, I'm encouraging you to say something about it to that person. Give them a gift that day. And again, you're giving yourself a gift as well because confidence gets confidence. So we've already talked a lot about building self-confidence and um, positive self-talk. And like I said earlier, we're going to have a little chance to practice our um, self-talk. So I know that I, um, I have already reframed some things. Like we say, we might say to ourselves, oh my gosh, I'm so stupid, or that was so stupid of me. Oh my gosh, we hear that all the time. Some of my coworkers say it so much, like when we were in the office together. It would drive me crazy because I so do not believe in that kind of self-talk. And I would never say to myself or anyone else, oh, I was so stupid. I would never say that because I like myself and I don't believe that that's true. And even if she's saying it in jest, words have power and words have energy. And there's something that comes through. Like I said, if you say something often enough, you're going to start to believe it. So instead of saying, oh, I'm so stupid, when you have a silly thing that just happened to you, or if you can't believe you made a certain choice or a comment, you can reframe it, right? And you can say, okay, maybe that wasn't my finest moment. <laughs> and, and, and then move on. Accept it and move on, but accept it without judgment. Another thing about positive self-talk is um, I do things called mantras. And I it might not be the technical term for mantras, um, but I say something like three times, something positive, and I repeat it three times. And I wrote three things down here. And um, for today, I want us to practice together just three really easy, simple ones. I am smart, I am capable, and I am confident. So behind your lovely masks, can you say that out loud with me three times? I am smart, I am capable, and I am confident. We're going to say it again. I am smart, I am capable, and I am confident. We're going to say it one more time. I am smart, I am capable, and I am confident. Awesome, ladies. Awesome. I wanted to do that, that particular exercise, because you know how many of us have, like, not ever really said those things to ourselves out loud, especially? And it's really magical if you can say those things out loud. There are lots of other ways that you can um, say positive things to yourself. Like I said before, maybe I like myself. That's a really hard one for some people to wrap their mouths around. They don't quite believe it yet. And that's okay. If you practice it, you can say it without believing it, first of all. Like if I wanted to tell myself I was the world's greatest photographer, I would say, wow, I'm the world's greatest photographer, but I don't believe it because I know that this person and this person and this person across the world is so much better. I've seen their prints. I know what they do. Um, but you start to believe it. You know why? Because when you're saying it, like if you say, um, I am the most time efficient person ever, like say you're, you're always late, always late. You're always 20 minutes late. You can never get into the car on time. If you get to the car, you have to stop at the gas station for some coffee or whatever. So you're going to work on being more time efficient. So you can start saying, I am so time efficient. I, I always pay attention to the clock. I'm always on time. And yet you know you're currently running 15 minutes late. That's okay. When you start saying that I'm always paying attention to the time, you're going to start making choices that follow suit with your clock. So you're going to start making choices to get up a little bit earlier or to not maybe um, drag your feet quite so much when you're getting ready. Um, so those things, that's kind of how that stuff works. So if you tell yourself you're good, you like yourself, you're smart, you're capable and confident, even if you don't believe it today, that's okay. That's where the practice comes in. And I would love for you guys to start saying that kind of thing to yourselves easily 20 times a day. I am not kidding. When I was learning how to have a strong sense of self-esteem when I was in my young 20s, 
that's what I would do. And at the time, I had a boyfriend, and um, we never talked about mental health. We never talked about confidence. We never talked about self doubt. And he knew I was going to go to counseling, but he didn't know why necessarily. So um, I said to him one day when I got this assignment from my counselor to work on this with uh, self affirmations, and I just real timidly kind of asked him, "So, what do you think about like self affirmations?" And he's like, oh my God, I do them all the day, all the time. I was like, what? No way. How do you mean? He's like, well, I'm always telling myself how good I am. I tell myself how cute I am. I tell myself I make good coffee. I tell myself this, that, and the other thing. I was shocked. And it was such a relief. Again, I faced my fear. I brought this topic out into the open that I didn't realize I was going to have to be talking about, but I was afraid to even the topic because I felt so silly. My, um, my thinking in that you got to keep telling yourself good things so that you keep believing that you're good and worthy and all that stuff. So now that we have said I'm smart, I'm capable, and I'm confident, we're going to practice some power poses. Um, power poses, this I got from Amy Cuddy, who's on uh, um, YouTube as well. Actually, I got it from Jordan Davis. She's a student at Kelly, and she introduced me to Amy Cuddy through YouTube. Amy Cuddy talks about power poses in that... When you are, um, say you're waiting for an interview, uh, most times people are trying to not take up a lot of space, they're trying to not make their presence known just because they are they want to blend in with the woodwork, basically. They don't want to draw attention to themselves, no, no negative attention. So they, you know, cross their legs or hold their arms or they look at their phone and they're in a very small space. She has done some research, and she has found out that when you're in these very small spaces, your body reacts, uh, your mind actually produces some chemicals. Um, cortisol is what I call, I don't remember her term, but it's the diminishing um, chemical that basically destroys your self-confidence. <laughs> it's disempowering. Cortisol is disempowering. Whereas, her studies have shown, if you start to take up space, you spread your legs, your, your feet are a nice wide distance apart. You kind of take up space and you form this position of power. Whatever that means to you, whatever that looks like to you, your body increases testosterone, which is the dominance hormone, and it decreases cortisol, the diminishing chemical. So when you go into these um, situations, like a, a, a maybe even a test, an exam that's kind of freaking you out, uh, or an interview, something like that, you are going to want to form a power pose. Now, she says for two minutes. Two minutes is the magic number for some reason. We're going to do power poses, but we're not going to make it that long because that would be that would feel silly. But anyway, um, we're going to increase our testosterone. We're going to increase this wonderful feeling of confidence and power um, by forming these power poses, and we're going to diminish that cortisol. So, um, EJ, we're going to play some music. So hold on for one second for me, EJ. Don't, don't do it yet. Cool. That's the song we're going to use, okay? I'm fine. Okay. But first, I want you ladies to stand up for me, ladies and gentlemen, if you don't mind. Um, make sure you have your masks on, just in case we get closer than six feet, okay? Now, I don't want you guys to feel totally self-conscious, so I want you to, first of all, let's practice a power pose, okay? So think about Wonder Woman, right? She stands there, feet apart, hands on her hips. That's a power pose. Shoulders are always back and strong, right? And shoulders are down, so you're not like... Like this, you're going to elongate your neck and your torso. Really come into a powerful pose. That's one of our power poses, right? What's another one? Does anyone have anything? Because I can keep suggesting. Okay, so stay here, but cross your arms. That's another one. Although we want to make sure that we're, that's powerful, but we want to make sure to take up a lot of space. That's our main effort, to take up space. So another one that we could do, you know, come up with a stance and rock that arm, however it feels, whether it's the opposite, I don't remember. <laughs> right now. That's a power pose. I know just standing here with, with just your feet apart and your hands down to your side. That's another power pose. In fact, I use that as my power pose in the uh, women in business. And I just did a, a little variation. I put one foot slightly in front of the other. Okay, one foot so that I have more balance. And I elongated my neck and my torso, shoulders back. And I just kind of lean forward just a little bit. Like I am come, I've come here and I'm going to take you down. That was my thought in my head. And so, again, these are just some of the power poses that we can come into. And we're going to hold each pose for just five to seven seconds. Again, Amy Cuddy 
uh, recommends doing it for two minutes to increase that testosterone, to increase that self-confidence and that feeling of power. We're just going to do it for five to seven seconds. So EJ, go ahead and play the music. Face away from me, okay? Make sure you're facing away from each other. Just face the building so you're not self-conscious, okay? Ladies and gentlemen, strike your first power pose. Feel it, girls and gentlemen. Get in that power pose. Hold it. You're strong. You're capable and you are confident. All right, let's choose pose two. Do another pose. Second power pose. Good job. I'm strong. I'm capable. I'm confident. Take up space, you guys. All right, are you feeling it? Woo, let's go to pose three. You can feel this. I know you can. Strong, capable, and positive. All right. Before you sit down, let's just say it again three times. I'm smart, I'm capable, I'm confident, okay? I'm smart, I'm capable, I'm confident. One more time. I'm smart, I'm capable, I'm confident. One more time. I am smart, I am capable, and I am confident. Awesome, you guys. Thank you for participating. I know you can go ahead and take a seat. I know that it feels funny and it feels a little bit silly, and that's okay. This is where I'm so grateful to you guys for being open to being vulnerable. Um, and I think that this is a safe space, but you had to put a lot of trust in each other and in me, and I so appreciate that you did. So good job. Um, so you know, these things are all going to help us to overcome the imposter syndrome when it comes knocking on our door. And again, it will. It happens to the best of us. I think I'm a pretty confident person, and it even happens to me. So, um... We're going to take it down a notch, and we're going to talk a little bit about isolation. Um, isolation can be really hard. It can be really hard to keep a good sense of mental health during an isolation or a period of isolation. I know that we've all experienced this isolation, drawing back, um, stepping away from our social circles, because we have had to. For the last seven months, we have been more isolated than ever in our lives. And this is just such an unreal thing that we've all been experiencing. And also the length of time, the duration that we've had, had to, ask, I was going to say that we've been asked to do something. We've needed to, it's out of necessity to keep us all safe. Um, it's really draining. So, um, my sister about isolation, she has, um, she has a very, very small circle of friends. In fact, she literally only has like two friends. And they're in poor health. Um, so we a lot. And that's hard because sometimes I can't be there for her. Sometimes, honestly, I don't want to be in her world. I don't want to be pulled in. And so I have to, I have to really decide um, if I can, if I want to step into her. Um, it sounds unkind, and I certainly don't mean it to be unkind or disrespectful, but she has a very chaotic world. Um, and she lives with a lot of chaos in her mind. And I, it's hard for me because I don't, and I don't understand it. I, I keep trying to understand why she thinks a certain way or why she behaves a certain way, and I don't get it. Um, but anyway, back to isolation, she does spend a lot of time alone. And I was gonna ask her, so she gave me some thoughts, and I know that she struggles more these days than she did in the years past because her, her um, conditions have gotten worse. So she said she, she, she isolates sometimes out of fear of being in public because her crazy might show. Those are her words. Her crazy might be showing a little too much, and she's afraid of being judged. Um, but I wanted to ask her for her, um, her methods of working through it, working through isolation, but I actually know better. She doesn't really know how to work through it. I keep suggesting things to her. Um, and for whatever reason, she most of the time does not follow through with it or she's not comfortable with it. And so she's alone a lot. 
So I know that I wanted to share just a couple things that I do or I have done in these last several months to make myself feel more connected because that's the key to fighting the isolation, the sense of isolation, which leads to loneliness, which can lead to depression and anxiety. Um, and it can take you down a, a, you know, a dark path and we don't want you to get there. Um, honestly, when they said, you know, there was this whole uh, stay at home thing, um, I did really well. I love working at home. So I was really, really happy to take my computer home and sit with my two kitties by my side all day long. I was in heaven. They were in heaven. I'm kind of a hermit anyway. I really am. So I am not the best person necessarily to talk about isolation because I don't necessarily feel um, a sense of loneliness when I'm alone. I get recharged by being alone. And that's primarily because my job is so um, social. So I talk to people all day long on the phone for my work. I was able to continue working. Um, I also email people all the time. I'm IMing, um, using Skype messaging to message my colleagues. I'm texting my friends. I do not feel isolated, even though I live alone. And we had the stay at home order. Um, but one of the things that I did notice was that by the end of the week, so I did really good. I didn't go to the grocery store except once a week, maybe every 10 days. Um, I tried the grocery delivery thing that did not work out for me. I tried to order like five Jack's frozen pizzas and they gave me 13 because I couldn't get it right on the computer. So I still have Jack's frozen pizza in the freezer because I didn't get my online order right. And anyway, um, I like to get out of the house and drive. I don't have to have a particular destination in mind, but it makes me feel connected to the community. I don't have to have a particular interaction with anybody. Um, but that's what I did every week. I would make sure that at least once a week on Sundays, usually Sunday afternoons, that's kind of a lonely time of day. That's how I perceive that time of day, like three to five on a Sunday. And, um, I would make sure that I would get out of the house, um, and just drive. I live on the West side. So I would inevitably come to the East side. It only takes 15 minutes. Um, I would inevitably drive around campus because I wanted to still feel that connection. I would drive up and down Walnut and College. I drive around the square a couple of times. I would drive down to the Dairy Queen on South Walnut. Um, sometimes go beyond that, but I just felt like that brought me a sense of relief for some reason. I don't exactly know why, um, but again, it it ultimately made me feel connected. Um, there are a lot of other things that you can do to fight the sense of isolation, and and you can find those on. Uh, anywhere on online. I, I included a list in this list of resources and references that I I've sent to Emily, so she's going to give you guys. Um, so you can find your own things to do. You know, they've suggested um, creating an online knitting circle or a baking circle or like um, do meal prep for the week with a friend on uh, FaceTime or something like that or a Zoom session. So there's tons and tons of um, suggestions out there. And again, the main idea is to stay connected somehow. So every day, touch someone or have someone reach out and touch you. Make sure you have a buddy system set up. Um, what I want to do, even though I know it's a very small group, that's okay. Can we just have you guys get into two groups like Amy and these three? And then, um, I don't know what your name is in the jean jacket, but if you can be with this group, that would be great. Can you guys just be vulnerable with each other and share some ideas on maybe what's been tough to get through um, and also how you have done it. What are the things that you guys have done to stay connected to your friends and family and loved ones? What are the things that you do or you think you'd like to do but you haven't done yet? Share some ideas. Um, if you can do that now, we're just gonna take a couple minutes, okay? And then I'd like to hear from a couple of you if you don't mind being a volunteer later and just sharing with me what they are, that would be great. Okay, so if you could get in those groups right now, that would be wonderful. Um, so we're just going to move on because I don't want to um, go over on our time and I know we're getting close. We're going to talk about just a few mental health tips in general um, and we've talked about so many good things today. Some of the things that you hear as mental health tips, they sound cliche and that's because they're said over and over again and they're said over and over again because they're true. Like get enough sleep, get some exercise and eat some good food, right? So I did not eat the 13 Jack's frozen pizzas that are in my freezer when they came. I actually spaced it out quite a bit because I don't want to eat junk. Because when I eat junk, it makes me feel lethargic and it makes me feel really bad about myself because I know better. So eat some broccoli, 
now and then, right? Eat your vegetables and eat some good solid protein. Um, try to stay light on the carbs because carbs actually cause something of what I call bread brain. They make me confused. Um, I don't think very clearly when I have too many carbs and they just really weigh me down. So I try really hard to eat healthy. Don't always accomplish it, but that's okay. Um, eat food and sleep. Another thing is sleep. It's so important because if you are sleep deprived, if you're not getting enough sleep on a regular basis, your perception can be really off base. And you can make some really bad decisions just because you're not thinking clearly. So again, sleep can really affect how you're thinking, which can affect how you're feeling, and vice versa. It can affect how you're feeling, which can affect how you're thinking. Um, also, that mind-body-spirit thing that people talk about is so true. It's so real. How many of you have tried yoga? Awesome. Awesome. I just started doing yoga last year. And I tell you what, it is so refreshing. I've never, I've never been a real Jillian Michaels kind of fan, you know, like I don't do boot camp kind of stuff. I just don't like being talked to that way. I don't like someone being mean and barking orders at me. So yoga really fulfills something in me that needs to be nurtured. And I just feel like I'm, I'm stretching my body. I'm doing something for me that's really important. And um, it all just kind of works together and it helps me to think about myself in good ways throughout the rest of the day. Again, I think it just wants, it sets a really good foundation. That's part of the exercise that I like to do. So I was going to make sure that I mentioned it because yoga is fabulous. And I don't know if any of you do yoga with Adrian on YouTube, but that's another you, YouTube thing. I do too. She's wonderful. And I follow her on Instagram. She's just so wonderful. And like I said, it's just always nurturing, which I really appreciate. Um, creating balance Especially if you're in the media industry, media can be tough, and there are always deadlines, and there are always time constraints, and you're always under pressure, always. When I was in the radio industry, now granted, again, I was in um, sales and marketing, which I don't know if any of you are going into, but I lived that job. I was really good at it, and I made some money, which is good, and I enjoyed it. I was able to be creative. Um, but I would find myself not sleeping at night because I was thinking of what I was going to do the next day. What is the deal that I was going to pitch? Who was going to say no? And what was going to be my plan B? Always, always. And, and I mean, it was really hard. So I decided back then, and that was back in 2000, maybe 2006, 2007, I was really struggling because I could not let my work, I couldn't leave it alone. So I decided... In the middle of one night, every time that I would start to think of work, it's kind of like meditation, you know, you try to clear your mind of everything, and within three seconds, some intruding thought comes in, and you have to fight it back again and again. That's how it was when I was in the radio industry, and I just decided to put up that stop sign. Stop. Stop. No more work thoughts tonight, and that is literally what I still say to myself if I'm um, ruminating over something at work or whatever. Create balance. Create boundaries for yourself. Whereas you guys knocked down some boundaries and that worked for you with this particular, you know, giving some hugs and stuff. Um, create balance by creating some boundaries. Like with my sister, I love her to the moon and back. And yet, I have set a very firm line in the sand. Eight o'clock is, I don't talk to her after 8 p.m. I don't talk to her. I don't text her. I won't answer her phone calls. And I have told her this so that she can understand what my boundaries are. Because I need to start winding down for the day. I need some Juliet time. And I need to recharge my batteries. And sometimes she will um, she will text me like 50 times in a day, easily, easily, um, about something or other. And most times when she's texting or trying to call me after 8 p.m., it's, it's a crisis situation. And I just can't deal with it. And so I set that boundary for myself. And I will talk to her tomorrow. In the meantime, if she has a crisis, she knows who she can turn to in her own community, but it's not going to be me. So um, it sounds really um, harsh, and I don't mean it that way, but I'm trying to take care of me. So I've set some firm boundaries, and I encourage you to do the same thing. Unplug, you guys. Unplug from your technology. Just set it down for a while, like 30 minutes if you can. I know. You guys are growing up in a totally different age than I grew up in, obviously. Um, and I love my phone. I love my tablet. I love my technology. But yet, I don't live by it. I don't let it rule me. Like, I just downloaded a new app. Um, it's listed in my list that you'll get in the email. 
It's called um, The Fabulous. And it's a really cool app so far. I really like it. But it's trying to get me to pay attention to it more often in the day than I want to. Like it's sending me notifications of this, that, and the other thing. And I'll look at it like once and then it gets annoying. I'm like, I don't want to be bothered by that. So just be aware of that too. I know we all need technology and I know it's really cool and a lot of it's fun, but just be aware of walking away from it every now and then. If you can do it like 30 minutes a day, that would be wonderful. You probably can. You probably do anyway. You're just not conscious of it. But um, anyway, unplug. Uh, we talked about self-talk, positive thoughts, being self-aware. Laugh, you guys. Laugh every day if you can. I I like this presentation that I gave today because it's light and breezy. This is what I call light and breezy. Mental health can get really heavy and really dark. I know that. I don't want to be that. I don't want to present that message today. I want to talk about maintaining good mental health. And these are some things that we can do to maintain good mental health. Um, and laughter is so refreshing. It just cleanses you from the inside out. So watch videos on YouTube or TikTok or whatever it is, wherever you can find humor. Find some humor in every day. Help each other to laugh. Um, and then of course, Pinterest. I know that I included some links to my Pinterest boards. Um, because those memes crack me up. Oh my gosh. I included two memes, <laughs> one of which, so these are mental health tips that we're going over, right? And I have bullet points and whatnot. And I don't know if you can see this. Did I include it? Probably not. It's over there. Anyway, at the end of my long list of mental health bullet points, <laughs> I found this meme that said, maybe swearing will help. Because I love to swear and I love to cuss. And I tell you what, I let it fly sometimes, you guys. I really do. And that is also a really big stress relief. Um, because I didn't grow up that way, and so I feel like I'm being really rebellious. And I cuss a little bit, and it just feels really good. So anyway, um, find something fun anywhere you can online. Make each other laugh. Bring joy to your own life. It's going to help you um, get through some lonely times, and it's going to help remind you day to day that you deserve to be joyful. Okay, so again, we're talking about mental health, and why? Why are we talking about mental health? Why does this? Why does it matter? Because you've you feel good when you have good mental health. It's just like physical health. We talked about that at the beginning. And what else? When you have good mental health, you're more creative. You're more innovative. You're a better problem solver if you have solid mental health. And in general, like I said, you feel good overall. The quality of your life is going to improve if you have good mental health. So make sure that you're talking to yourself positively. Make sure that you're aware of those thoughts that are coming into your mind. Make sure if they're negative, you're going to reframe them and turn them around so that they're a positive. And you're going to assess whether the things that you think that those thoughts that come in, that errant thoughts that try to tell you that you're, you don't deserve it or you're not good enough, you're going to turn those around and walk away from them because they're lies and you're going to recognize them as lies. And you're going to say, I choose to believe something else. That's going to build your self confidence. That's going to help you um, manage imposter syndrome when it comes along. Um, so basically, um, that's kind of all I had for today, you guys. I so appreciate your tenacity for sitting in the wind for the last hour. So if you have any questions, I would be happy to answer them. You are going to get the entire presentation of, in your email, as well as the list of resources and references that I included um, about all the different things that I enjoy and that I've used to create this presentation today. So you're free to go. Enjoy your Friday. If you guys have questions, thank you again for your attention. I really enjoyed being here.